Late 1780s, France. The country was facing severe economic and political crises. It was deeply in debt due to its involvement in expensive wars and the government was slow, corrupt and ineffective. The situation worsened. Bad harvests leading to widespread famine, making the people of France angrier and angrier. Philosophers and writers of the time predicted that a revolution was looming, that it was inevitable. The era that France was in, later known as the Enlightenment, came with ideas that challenged authority and inspired new ways of thinking about politics, religion and society. The ideas of philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau laid the groundwork for a revolution. Napoleon Bonaparte, during this time, was aware of the imbalances within the army and French society as a whole. He believed that the king and his small circle had too much power and that France needed a new constitution that would reflect the will of the people, ensuring that the king always acted in the nation's interest. Napoleon's early twenties were formative, as he devoted most of his time to studies, deeply engaging with history, the art of war, political science and law. He filled over 50 notebooks with his thoughts and wrote drafts of novels and stories. His reading list was extensive covering topics from artillery, projectiles and war tactics, to history, particularly that of Corsica. Classical and philosophical works, including those of Rousseau, Plutarch and Cicero, were among those who influenced his thought the most. During the French Revolution, Napoleon decided to return to Corsica. Why? Well, he was motivated by his belief that the revolution could help improve poor conditions on the island. He hoped to be involved in the revolutionary events in Corsica, seeing it as a chance for the island. At the time, Napoleon aligned himself more and more with radical ideologies in Paris and was instrumental in founding the first radical political club on Corsica, the Jacobin Club. His involvement in politics intensified as he became an officer in Corsica's National Guard, competing against and eventually defeating his family's arch nemesis, Pozzo di Borgo, in an election for the position of lieutenant colonel. He accomplished a few things during this period, including intervening with the National Guard against priests who defied the law, and engaging in conflicts that almost led to him facing a military court. But this wasn't making him any money. His sole income was relying on his job in the regiment in Paris. His leave had long expired and was therefore removed from the payroll. In panic, Napoleon returned to Paris to rectify his situation. Luckily for him, due to a shortage of officers in the French military, instead of facing dismissal or trial, Napoleon was promoted to the rank of captain on July 10th, with an annual salary of 1,600 francs. His experiences during the French Revolution included witnessing the storming of the Tuileries Palace, with the massacre that came with it. This massacre deeply impacted Napoleon. He was disturbed by the brutal violence and lack of discipline among the revolutionary forces. This period forged Napoleon into a skillful, disciplined leader, although he hadn't risen to power yet. The year is 1804. There were constant threats and conspiracies from royalists and the British, which made the people of France rally behind Napoleon. There were multiple directions that France could go towards during this time, and it was feared that without a leader like Napoleon, there were a few things that could happen. The return of the royal family and the old feudal system, taking France back to the Dark Ages, the rise of a military dictator, or a return of the Jacobins, who held a reign of terror over France for years after the French Revolution. Ten years without a king, the French wanted a strong leader but were against a return of a king. Napoleon claimed that he wanted to embody the French Revolution and saw himself as a natural choice to be promoted. On May 4th, 1804, the Senate proposed that Napoleon Bonaparte should be the Emperor of France, which became a law on May 18th, 1804, officially making Napoleon the Emperor of France. The man whose philosophy had been shaped through wars and a revolution immediately started introducing new systems and reforms to the shaky France. Napoleon knew the effectiveness of a reward-based system. He believed in rewarding individuals based on their achievements, not on their family name or social status. This approach, called meritocracy, opened up positions, especially in the military, to all capable men, regardless of their class or wealth. And five years into his rule, Napoleon even created his own nobility, assigning titles like Prince, Duke, Count, Baron and Knight, mostly to military figures based on their merit. But he also introduced significant social reforms, focusing heavily on education, 
rebuilding and opening new schools with the introduction of lycées, equivalent to high schools, and opening up higher education institutions for law and administration, some of which are still open today. These schools were ensured to be affordable, if not free, so that even the poorest could receive proper education, following the meritocratic principles that guided his rule. Paris was swiftly transformed into the world's most beautiful city, which was a plan that Napoleon had envisioned immediately as he took power. Landmarks, roads, bridges and public works were constructed, which changed the face of Paris. A unified legal system, combining various laws into one legal framework known as Code Napoleon was introduced, which still influences French law today. These reforms were comprehensive and extremely progressive for its time, rewarding hard work, motivating those under him to strive for excellence, bringing order to the country. By the spring of 1811, Napoleon was at the peak of his influence, ruling over an empire extending from the Atlantic to Belarus and from the Baltic Sea to the Ionian Sea, comparable in size to the Western Roman Empire or Charlemagne's realm. This empire, with over 70 million inhabitants, included seven vassal kings and numerous dukes and princes. What was behind this massive success? Well, the philosophy that is now known as Bonapartism. This is what held the empire together, a strong centralized state, which was in Paris, a leader with significant dictator-like power and the promotion of nationalism and military achievement. I mentioned that Napoleon had dictator-like power. Well, he was effectively a dictator, ruling in an autocratic way. There was an inconsistency between his philosophy and his actions, but this could be attributed to the rapid growth and increasing diversity of the empire. It needed a strong leader. But this growth and diversity, which at first could be seen as a sign of strength, turned into the beginning of the end for the French Empire. Napoleon himself might not have fully realized that the decline had already started. Unity and control was hard to maintain, whilst Napoleon was growing older, physically changed looking pale and unwell. His physical shape was a symbol of how the Empire itself was looking. He knew that changes had to be made expressing a desire for public debates, free elections, accountable ministers and press freedom. These aspirations led to the drafting of a new liberal constitution by Benjamin Constant. A new legislature was established, expanding the voter base and making it ten times larger than during the reign of Louis XVIII, where only a few thousand wealthy individuals had the right to vote. The meeting of the parliaments were also made public, and political proposals were made to be debated. A jury was also introduced to the legal system, similar to that in Great Britain. Napoleon recognized that there was a need for a more liberal and participatory governance structure. These changes were his effort to stabilize the empire in a hope to change the downward trajectory. With an ever-growing hunger for expansion and tension between Napoleon and Alexander of Russia, an invasion was planned. Despite receiving numerous reports, including a detailed analysis from the well-informed French ambassador in St. Petersburg, Armand de Calancourt, which outlined all the arguments against an invasion, Napoleon remained unyielding. Calancourt warned of the geographical, climatic, political, military, diplomatic and logistical nightmare that such an invasion would bring with it. However, both Napoleon and Alexander of Russia were unmovable in their positions. Russia demanded significant portions of the Grand Duchy of Warsaw and the withdrawal of French troops from Prussia, which Napoleon refused. This unyielding attitude was what once made the French Empire so great, but now set the stage for Napoleon's greatest failure. The prompt Russian campaign was a catastrophic failure for Napoleon, making several critical mistakes. The war was initiated before concluding another war with Spain. It was started too late and the invasion itself had extremely poor planning, with distances between supply depots being far too long. The French army lingered in cities like Vilna, Vitebsk and especially Moscow, leading to a slow disaster. After this, a wave of nationalism swept across the French-controlled territories. The Rhine Confederation was dissolved, uprisings broke out in Holland, and Wellington was advancing towards France from the Pyrenees. The old, aristocratic families of Europe, the post kings and the pope rejoiced at Napoleon's failures. Despite still having a large, functional army and with Napoleon being a brilliant military leader, the political landscape had shifted against him. Alexander of Russia ordered a march into Paris, which left Napoleon isolated in the countryside. This one strategic move effectively ended his rule. 
documents concerning the Bonaparte family were being burned by the secretaries, and the chief of the Louvre requested permission to evacuate the museum's treasures as Cossacks stood at the outskirts of Paris. Napoleon was defeated and promptly exiled as a prisoner on the small desolate island of St. Helena. Here, he was isolated and far removed from the power and influence he once had. His philosophy started to change as he reflected alone on the island, becoming nihilistic in a depressive state. But despite his fall from power, Napoleon was convinced of his enduring place in history. He expressed to Lacassesse, his companion in exile, a unique perspective on his destiny. My fate is the opposite of other men's. They fall into oblivion when they are overthrown. My defeat raises me to unimaginable heights. Each day, a little of the tyrant and my cruelty fades away. He believed that he would outlive those who had defeated him, saying, I will survive. Those who belittle me will find that they belittle themselves.